snacks in Germany were kind enough to send us the TX167 for review. So let's dig in. Unusually, this camera has front collision warnings, lane departure warnings, and also speed sign recognition built in. The camera supports 128GB microSD cards, but they aren't included. The sides of the box show the features and benefits of the camera, with the extra special features highlighted here, and the underside showing all the specs. Inside the box, we are greeted with the camera. Removing the protective foam and the cardboard, we are then greeted with the accessories. First out, the power supply. Looks like it's got a nice long lead, which makes a change. Here we have the standard sort of suction cup mount. And lastly, the manual. Available in multiple languages, as you'd expect. Let's take the camera out of its uh, plastic cover and take a look at this quite unique design. Quite a flat camera with a very protruding lens and unusually a field of view of only 130 degrees. And the reason for that flat design is this rather big 4 inch 800 by 480 pixel screen. And whilst it's not touch sensitive, it does help with those additional features which you don't get on other dash cams. On the right are the control buttons, mode, up, OK, down and menu. On the front of the camera inside the screen is the indicator LED as well. On the underside of the camera, the micro SD card slot and the microphone. On the top of the camera, the mounting point, the mini USB charging socket, and some form of 2.5mm audio socket, but whatever it is, it's not actually mentioned in the manual at all. This is actually the recessed reset button. This appears to be some form of IR receiver or sensor. That's just a, an air vent. And at the bottom here, that is the speaker. The camera has a resolution of 1920 by 1080, so full HD, and records at 30 frames a second, though it does record in an unusual TS format, more commonly used with DVDs. Despite the impressive looking lens, this knurled ring and the lens hood don't move. This appears to be more of a design nod towards SLR cameras rather than anything functional. Overall, I quite like the styling. I think it gives it a good designer look, and it is very different from a lot of the other cameras so it makes it look more its £110 price tag. OK, so let's take a look at that power supply. Standard fare, usual sprung mount contacts, power LED on the side, and the 90 degree micro USB connection at the other end. Unfortunately, whilst it is rated to 1.5 amps, which is quite ample, you'll see there's a fixed cable on the rear of the charger, and for some reason, no USB socket for charging your phone, which is disappointing especially as the camera only draws half an amp from that one and a half amp power supply, so there is some slack. OK, let's take a look at that mount. The underside of the suction cup is actually slightly sticky, so it adheres to the window very well, and the actual vacuum it creates is better than most, so it should stay stuck firmly to your windscreen. As is typical, a standard ball and socket joint with a knurled adapter ring to actually tighten it up. Position the camera how you want, Tighten up the knurled ring, and once you've done that, the camera should stay firm. Simply screw the mount into the mounting hole on the camera, like so, and then do up this ring here to make sure the camera is firmly held by the mount. Once it's stuck to your windscreen, simply position, and when it's in the right position, do up the knurled ring for a nice firm grip. Next, of course, you plug in here the power supply, so you take the micro USB end and insert that into the camera, like so, and then the other end you insert into your cigarette lighter. As we touched on earlier, the manual is available in most European languages. It covers everything we've been looking at already, positions of the buttons, etc. But it does go into quite some detail about how the camera should be positioned and how the picture should look on the screen using the guide crosshairs. This is to make sure that the lane departure warning, the front collision warning, and the traffic sign recognition all function correctly. The camera should be positioned accurately as shown in the manual to make sure that these functions work correctly. Also in the manual, the usual fault finding and technical specifications. There's the confirmation of the display size, a full four inches, which is great. And also it mentions how long the power cord length is, three and a half meters, so plenty of slack to play with. So what you get in the box is the TX167, 
the in-car power supply, the windscreen mount and the manual. In fairness to Technax, my 622 has the prime spot, so the TX167 has had to go as close as possible to where it's suggested in the manual. Now we're all plugged in, we're ready to go, so let me just show you the screen and how good that is. That vibrant and crisp 4 inch screen is far superior to the 622. It's just a shame about that mount, it really is a bit tall. That does of course mean careful positioning, follow the instructions in the manual so that it doesn't obscure your vision. Though being able to see the warnings it brings up are very handy. Now we're in the car, let's see about those features. I've got no idea what that said, absolutely none. It's so distorted it's unhearable. Can't hear what's being said. It's a shame that the small speaker inside the TX167 lets it down. The sound is very distorted and you can't actually hear what the automated voice is telling you, which sort of ruins the whole proposition. In case you didn't get it, it said lane departure. Lane departure. Keep distance. The sound being captured by the Insta360 GO 2, which is mounted about two inches from the screen, is far superior to what you can actually hear in the car. The second function you heard there was keep distance for when it spots what it believes is a car in the road. Here's another example. Keep distance. The AI in the car didn't actually spot the car there, it spotted something else, so I'm not quite sure what it thought it saw. Equally, junctions seem to be a bit of an issue, especially when they're quite wide. Find a path. Keep distance. Short distance, yeah, short distance I can just about hear. Now I'm doing 12 miles an hour. Even at such a low speed in a modern car, I still really couldn't hear what it was actually saying. I thought it said short distance, and it isn't. I've got no idea what it's saying. Even at 5 miles an hour, I'm struggling to hear what it's saying. Turn that off instantly. It's a shame that a lot of these functions appear to be going to waste because, as you've just heard me say there, live, on camera, I would turn that function off because you cannot hear what it's saying to you. On an unobstructed single lane road as this is, it's all one way here. It does a reasonable job of tracking the car until it spots another car and then until that vehicle's cleared the view it doesn't lock on again so it doesn't highlight multiple vehicles it only seems to pick one so i'm not quite sure it's capable of tracking everything that it sees how about speed limits speed limit 20. So i recognize the speed sign so whilst it correctly identified a 40 limit it did, however, then warn me about a car I should keep my distance from, but it was coming the other way in the other lane. So the AI on board still has a lot of work, I think. It does seem to struggle somewhat with tracking vehicles, particularly multiple vehicles, and equally, warning about oncoming vehicles when they're not in the same lane as me means a faster processor or more software development, I think. As for the camera quality, it's not bad. It's full HD, it's a little washed out in the colours, but other than that, in this overcast but still bright day, it has recorded the images really well. It's crisp, it's sharp, and you can see everything you need to. The camera uses the IMX307 sensor and uses the NTK96675 chipset, so is comparable with many other cameras in this price bracket who all use the same chipset and sensor. Lane departure, is that what it's supposed to say? At this point I've swapped the speed limit warning over to just tones rather than voice. However, it's actually spotted the speed limit for the side road, not for the road I'm on. So the camera now thinks I'm in a 30 limit zone. And then when we pass the national speed limit sign, it doesn't spot it at all. It didn't spot the 60 limit there. Sorry, national speed limit. still says 30 on the screen. 
I believe that this is due mainly to the fact that the camera is actually designed for the German roads and therefore the EU market. And therefore what it's looking for is actually circular road signs with speed limits in kilometers per hour. So it doesn't recognize our NSL sign because it's not designed for our market. I mentioned earlier about the camera looking a little washed out. So let's do some techie stuff. Here's the uh, vector scope and you can see it's topping out at 100% here. It's flatlining. So the sky here in the center is actually blown out. It is overexposed. Yet at the bottom, it has underexposed the blacks. So a combination of this and the overexposure is the reason for it looking washed out. Okay, let's do some speed sign tests. Let's start in a 30 zone and see how we get on. Got that one okay. I'll explain the 80 limit shortly. But if you watch the screen, you'll see it spots two speed signs. And again, no problem there, got those. Now in a 40 zone, this time with a yellow border. And again, no problem with those. However, this one here, it didn't react to. Now that might be because it's only just announced a 40 zone. Okay, let's try a 50 zone and see how we get on. And again, no problems, spotted that without issue. Here's a slightly more obscure one, very tiny sign on the right hand side. However, it also spots that without issue. I did a few additional tests on the NSL sign just to make sure. Okay, didn't recognize the national speed limit sign again. Nope, missed that one as well. Yeah, it does not recognize NSL signs. It therefore looks like it has to be a red circle with a number in it. However, having just exited a 40 zone past an NSL sign which it missed, it then did this. 80. This is an 80 area. Logically the speed in the UK is 70 miles an hour, but this is indicating 80 kilometers an hour because it misread the SO sign. Slightly concerning, but I suppose it is reading EU signs or it thinks so. Okay. Let's do some night tests. Here we can see in a built-up area, street lighting, shop lighting, etc., as well as the headlights from the car. Seems reasonably well lit, cameras coping pretty well. No real issues here. Let's just bring up the vector scope again and take another look. Now we can see that actually it doesn't top out at 100, it copes much better. And at the bottom of the vector scope, blacks are far more closer to zero. So the camera quite clearly copes better in darker conditions than in light. Moving on to a less well-lit scene with just the street lights on the one side, we can see again the camera's still coping really well. Only headlights and the street lights on the one side, but nevertheless the recorded image quality is still really good. Moving out to the dual carriageway, and whilst I do have adaptive headlights, these are the only source of light for the camera. The image quality still is perfectly usable though. Moving on to an unlit country road, you can again see the camera has picked up all of the details from the road quite clearly using just the headlights. In a small unlit village here, you can see on main beam, the camera is picking up everything quite nicely. This I think proves that the camera works much, much better at night than it does during the day where it seems to struggle a little. In this scene, you can see the garage is overexposed, but the rest of the shot is very clear. Given how dark the rest of the scene is though, I think the camera performed admirably under the circumstances. In summary then, I quite like the design of the camera. It distinguishes itself by not being boring and black like most of the others. However, this may add to its desirability for would-be thieves. The inherently flat design and that very gorgeous screen are definite bonus points. The size and vibrancy makes it a real bonus for this camera. However, the mounting point at the top sort of lets it down for positionability in the car. It's a pity the screen isn't a touchscreen, but the buttons work well unlike the AI, which I still think needs an awful lot of work, as does the speaker, which is virtually useless. Add in the unusual TS recording format and the fairly hefty £110 price tag, and I think there are better cameras out there for your money. It's a shame because you can see what they're trying to do. It's unfortunately just not been executed as well as it should have been. It's a shame because I really like the camera and I feel what it's being let down by is software. However, you don't have to pay £110 for this camera because we're giving it away. 
So, if you want to be in with the chance of winning this camera, all you have to do is comment below and tell me why you would like to win it. Are you going on a European holiday? Do you know somebody who drives too quickly who needs to be reminded of the speed limits? What about lane guidance or driving too close to the car in front? All of these features are available on this camera. So, tell me why you want to win this camera or for who it's for and you could be drawn at random in the next couple of weeks. Good luck! Thank you for watching, but remember to subscribe and hit that bell.